Welcome back to Biomechanics. Today we're going to discuss the theory and physical properties of elastic solids. Elastic solids have a unique unloaded natural state. The stress in an elastic solid depends only on the strain, not on the strain history or strain rate or other properties of the strain. The work done by the stress in deforming an elastic solid material is stored as potential energy that is released when the stresses are removed. Consequently, the deformation of an elastic solid is a thermodynamically reversible process. In other words, the stress is independent of the strain history. So the stress depends only on the strain at the current point and current time in the body. Elasticity is a very useful idealization for many engineering materials, and it's also useful for most solid biological tissues, even though we will learn that they often exhibit significant anelastic properties as well. The simplest and commonest approximation in elasticity is a linear stress-strain relationship, which is known as Hookean elasticity. To demonstrate the properties of a linear Hookean elastic solid. Let's imagine a uniform cylindrical sample with uniaxial loads F applied to each end, a cross-sectional area of A, and a length of L. The uniaxial stress in this specimen, assuming its orientation is in the X direction, would be Txx, which is F divided by A. The uniaxial strain, epsilon xx, would be the length change delta L divided by the original unloaded length L. Now, if we plot the stress Txx versus the uniaxial strain epsilon xx for a linear elastic Hookean solid, we get a straight line, and the slope of that straight line is called E, the Young's modulus. For this experiment, E would be the Young's modulus in tension, though if the forces were compressive, we could make a similar measurement where the stress and the strain components would both be negative, as they are on this side of the curve, and in that case, E would be called the Young's modulus in compression. In the same experiment, we could also measure strain in the transverse direction, so epsilon yy or epsilon zz, and plot that versus the axial strain. As we stretch axially, the specimen will shrink somewhat in the transverse direction. So for a positive epsilon xx, we'll have negative epsilon yy or epsilon zz. And the magnitude of the slope of that relation is called nu, the Poisson ratio. So the Poisson ratio measures the fraction of the uniaxial strain by which the sample shrinks transversely when it's stretched or the fraction of the uniaxial compressive strain by which it expands transversely. Now it's important to understand that this approximation of linear Hookean elasticity is generally only useful when the strains are small and hence the linear infinitesimal Cauchy strain tensor that we've used here is a valid measure. Hooke's law for elastic solids is applicable to many engineering materials but to only a small number of biological tissues and biomaterials. The Young's modulus E and the Poisson ratio nu are called the technical constants and can be determined, as we've seen from this example, by a single uniaxial tension or compression test. They are sufficient to fully define the material properties of a Hookean elastic solid that is isotropic, meaning that its properties are the same, regardless of the orientation from which our sample was cut in the original material. So here we have two simplifications of elasticity, that of a linear stress-strain relationship and an isotropic material. So we've seen a specific stress-strain relationship for a linear Hookean elastic material under the specific loading conditions of uniaxial tension or compression. But 
The constitutive law needs to be able to describe the relationship between the stress and the strain for all possible loading conditions. So now let's go ahead and introduce the general constitutive law for a linear Hookean elastic solid. The most general linear relationship between the Cauchy stress tensor components Tij and the Cauchy infinitesimal strain tensor components epsilon kl is Tij equals Cijkl epsilon kl, which if we were to write out in full would look like this for the first few stress components. T11 would be C1111 times epsilon 11 plus C1112 times epsilon 12 plus C1113 times epsilon 13 plus C1121 times epsilon 21 plus C1122 times epsilon 22, etc all the way up to C1133 times epsilon 33. So that's one linear equation relating T11 to the nine components of the Cauchy strain. Similarly, T12 would be a second linear equation relating T12 linearly to the nine components of the Cauchy strain tensor, with the coefficients being given by C1211, C1212, etc. Here again is T13, which is C1311 times epsilon 11 plus C1312 times epsilon 12, etc., up to C1333 times epsilon 33. So, what this little equation states is actually nine linear equations relating the nine components of the Cauchy stress linearly to the nine components of the Cauchy strain through nine by nine constants. So Cijkl is called the elasticity tensor. It's a fourth order tensor of material constants and its units are the same as those of stress because the Cauchy strain is dimensionless. Three to the power of 41 is 81 components. So you can think of this 81 as being nine equations, each with nine coefficients, or you can think of the four indices, each having three possible values. So either way, Cijkl contains a total of 81 components. However, in general, there are symmetry conditions that will limit the number of these coefficients that are actually different. For example, we know that Tij is equal to Tji and epsilon kl is equal to epsilon lk. Therefore, Cijkl must equal Cjikl and Cijkl must equal Cijlk because Tij equals Tji and epsilon kl equals epsilon lk. So that actually reduces the number of coefficients from 81 or 9 times 9 to 6 times 6 which is 36 because we really only have six different stress components and six different strain components due to the symmetry of the stress and strain tensors meaning there are really only 6 by 6 or 36 different components at most in the fourth order elasticity tensor. However it actually simplifies a little bit more. If we go back to our first lecture where we derive the increment of work due to the stresses and show that an increment of work dw is tij d epsilon ij, then plugging in the constitutive law for a linearly elastic material, we could therefore write that an in increment of work dw is equal to cij kl epsilon kl d epsilon ij. And if we then integrate that expression, we would get that W is equal to the integral of Cijkl epsilon kl d epsilon ij, which is one half Cijkl epsilon kl times epsilon ij, which means it's also the same as if I swapped these two terms and wrote one half Cjkl ij times epsilon ij epsilon kl. In other words, in addition to Tij equaling Tji and epsilon kl equaling epsilon lk, meaning that Cijkl equals Cjikl and 
CIJ KL equals CIJ LK, we can also swap the I and J with the K and L and write that CIJ KL must equal CKL IJ. And that's because of the definition of the scalar work, which leaves us with 21 independent constants. So one way to think about this is if you were to write the six independent stress components in a vector, that, that vector would have six rows. And if we wrote the six independent strain components in another vector or column matrix with six rows, then the elasticity tensor would have 36 values, would be a six by six matrix with 36 separate values. And that matrix itself is symmetric, leaving 21 independent constants. So to review, the elasticity tensor is a fourth order tensor with a total of 81 components but at most 21 of them are actually different and independent. Now that's still an impractically large number of material constants to measure for any material. And in practice, we never have to because there are further simplifications uh, to the constitutive equation, uh, to the elasticity tensor in the case of Hookean elasticity. And those come about by considerations of the structure of the material or what we call the material symmetry. And the simplest case of all is called isotropy. And in an isotropic elastic material, we say that the response of the material to a particular material test, such as the uniaxial tension or compression test that we described earlier, is independent of the orientation in the sample from which we removed our test specimen. So Unlike in, for example, a piece of muscle or a piece of wood, which has a grain, and if we cut along the grain of the wood versus across the grain of the wood, we'd get different properties. In an isotropic material, the properties would be the same, regardless of the orientation from which our specimen was taken. And that greatly reduces the number of independent constants in the constitutive equation. So let's look at the special case of isotropic Hookean elastic solids. In isotropic materials, the response is the same regardless of the orientation of the test sample with respect to the original material. A general fourth order tensor satisfying the symmetries that we described on the previous page at, that is also isotropic has the following form. So Cijkl equals lambda times delta ij times delta kl plus mu times delta ik delta jl plus delta il delta jk so in other words we have reduced something that had 21 different independent constants to something that could be described in terms of two constants lambda and mu and hence tij equals cij kl epsilon kl simplifies to lambda times delta ij times delta kl times epsilon kl plus mu times delta ik times delta jl times epsilon kl plus mu times delta il times delta jk times epsilon kl which further simplifies so this becomes lambda times delta ij times delta kl epsilon kl turns the l in epsilon here into a k this delta turns epsilon kl into epsilon kk here Delta IK and Delta JL turn Epsilon KL into Epsilon IJ, so we get Mu Epsilon IJ. And here, Delta IL, Delta JK turn Epsilon KL into Epsilon JI. Now, Epsilon IJ and Epsilon JI are equal to each other because the Cauchy strain is symmetric. So therefore, this further reduces to TIJ equals lambda times delta ij, the Kronecker delta, times epsilon kk, the trace of the Cauchy strain, plus 2 mu times epsilon ij. Or in direct notation, the Cauchy stress t is equal to lambda times the trace of the Cauchy strain, plus 2 times mu times the Cauchy strain. And this is the constitutive law for an isotropic linearly elastic solid. And if we expand this to write the components of the stress for this special case of the constitutive law, we can see that T11 is equal to lambda times the trace of epsilon or epsilon kk 
So lambda times epsilon 1, 1 plus epsilon 2, 2 plus epsilon 3, 3 plus 2 mu times epsilon 1, 1. T2, 2 is the same except it's plus 2 mu times epsilon 2, 2. And T33 three, three is the same except that it's plus 2 mu times epsilon 3, 3. So this term involving lambda appears in the normal stresses because the delta ij is 1 when i equals j. When i is not equal to j, this term doesn't appear, and so we get that t23 is just 2 times mu times epsilon 23, t13 is 2 times mu times epsilon 13, and t12 is equal to 2 times mu times epsilon 12. Let's try an exercise now. Try to simplify the constitutive equation for a Hookean isotropic elastic solid to obtain an expression for the Young's modulus capital E in terms of the Lame constants lambda and mu and the Poisson ratio nu. Did you get A that E equals 2 mu, B equals lambda minus 2 mu lambda, C equals lambda minus 2 nu lambda plus 2 mu, D equals lambda minus 2 nu lambda, or E, E equals lambda plus 2 mu. So let's start by writing an equation for the special case of uniaxial tension, which would be T11 equals E times epsilon 1 by definition of E which from the constitutive equation for the Hookean elastic solid will be lambda times E11 plus E22 plus E33 plus 2 mu times E11. Now, making use of the definition of the Poisson ratio, namely that E22 and E33 in this case is equal to minus nu times E11, then we get that E times epsilon11 is lambda times epsilon11 times 1 minus 2 nu plus 2 mu times epsilon 1, 1. Now we can cancel epsilon 1, 1 on both sides and get that E is equal to lambda times 1 minus 2 nu plus 2 mu, or lambda minus 2 nu lambda plus 2 mu, which is answer C. Now let's consider the other stress components in this problem and use them to eliminate nu from the previous answer to obtain an expression for the Young's modulus E only in terms of the Lame constants, lambda and mu. Did you get A, mu times 2 lambda plus 3 mu, all over lambda plus mu? B, mu times 3 lambda plus 2 mu over lambda plus mu. C, lambda squared over lambda plus mu plus 2 mu. D, 3 lambda plus 2 mu over mu times lambda plus mu. Or E, mu times 3 lambda plus mu over lambda minus mu. So now we make use of the fact that the normal stress is perpendicular to the axis of the tension T22 and T33 are equal to zero, which gives us from the isotropic Hookean elastic solids constitutive law that lambda times epsilon 1, 1 plus epsilon 2, 2 plus epsilon 3, 3 plus 2 mu times epsilon 2, 2 or epsilon 3, 3 is equal to zero. Now substituting in for epsilon 2, 2 and 3, 3 again using the Poisson ratio, we get that lambda epsilon 1, 1 times 1 minus 2 nu minus 2 mu nu times epsilon 1, 1 is equal to 0. And then again we can cancel epsilon 1, 1 from this to get that lambda plus 2 lambda nu minus 2 mu nu is equal to 0, which we can rearrange for nu in terms of the Lame coefficients equals a lambda over 2 plus times lambda plus mu. Now we can substitute that into the expression that we got above for E, which was lambda minus 2 nu lambda plus 2 mu, to get lambda minus 2 lambda times nu, which is 
lambda over 2 times lambda plus mu plus 2 times nu, then that can be rearranged to lambda times lambda plus mu minus lambda squared plus 2 mu times lambda plus mu all over lambda plus mu. Well, we cancelled the 2's here, multiplied this term and this term by lambda plus mu. The lambda squares here cancel, so we get lambda squared plus lambda mu minus lambda squared plus 2 lambda mu plus 2 mu squared over lambda plus mu. These terms cancel and simplifies to mu times 3 lambda plus 2 mu divided by lambda plus mu, which is answer B. So let's review the technical constants for isotropic Hooke and elastic solids, E and nu, and their relationship to the Lame constants. The technical constants are measured from a standard uniaxial test. The Young's modulus E is the slope of the stress-strain curve, and the Poisson ratio nu is a negative of the ratio of the transverse to axial strains. So putting this particular situation into the constitutive law for an isotropic Hooke and elastic solid, then we would write that T11 is equal to E times epsilon 11, which would therefore be lambda times epsilon 11 plus epsilon 22 plus epsilon 33 plus 2 mu times epsilon 11 from the constitutive equation, which can be rearranged then to lambda times epsilon 11 minus nu times epsilon 11, since epsilon 22 and epsilon 33 are the transverse strains in the uniaxial experiment, they are equal to minus nu times the axial strain. So we get lambda times E11 minus nu times epsilon 11 minus nu times epsilon 11 plus 2 mu times epsilon 11. So now we have a relationship between T11 and epsilon 11 in terms of the Lame constants and the Poisson ratio that we can equate to the Young's modulus E. So that then gives us that E is equal to lambda times 1 minus 2 nu plus 2 times mu. So this is the example that we just did a moment ago. Then, noting that in the perpendicular directions, T22 and T33, the normal tractions, should be zero because no forces have been applied in that, along that axis. That means that T22 is equal to zero, which is lambda times epsilon 11 plus epsilon 22 plus epsilon 33 plus 2 mu times epsilon 22. Again, making use of the definition of the Poisson ratio, epsilon 11 is minus epsilon 22 divided by nu. And epsilon 22 and epsilon 33 are the same by symmetry and isotropy. In other words, there's no reason for the transverse strain to be any different in any transverse direction. So therefore, we now have that T22 is related to epsilon 22 by lambda and nu and mu. And that term being equal to zero allows us to rearrange here and solve for mu in terms of lambda and nu, so that we get lambda times 1 minus 2 nu over nu is equal to 2 times mu. And then we've used these two results to solve for E and nu in terms of lambda and mu. So E is mu times 3 lambda plus 2 mu divided by lambda plus mu, and nu is equal to lambda over 2 times lambda plus mu. So this shows us that the uniaxial tension test if we measure both the Young's modulus and the Poisson ratio, is sufficient to give us the constitutive equation for an isotropic Hooke and elastic solid, and therefore to compute the stresses for any strain state, not just the uniaxial tension or compression state that we did our test in. There are other technical constants. The shear modulus, for example, is called G, and it's half the slope of the shear stress versus the shear strain curve. So it's like the Young's modulus, but it's for shear stress versus shear strain, and it's half the slope of the curve rather than the slope. Now, if we take the constitutive law for the case when i is not equal to j, in other words, when we have shear, then Tij is equal to 2 mu times epsilon ij. That means that g 
g and mu are the same because the slope of the shear stress versus the shear strain is two times mu so half the slope is mu so in this case the lame constant mu is the technical constant it is the shear modulus g another technical constant that's sometimes used and reported is called the bulk modulus k and it equals the mean stress sigma naught divided by the volume change or dilatation delta so we can derive this by computing the mean stress which is one third of the trace of the stress or one third tkk and one third of tkk would be one third of lambda times delta kk which is three times epsilon kk which is epsilon 1 1 plus epsilon 2 2 plus epsilon 3 3 so the one third and the three cancel plus one third of two mu times the trace of epsilon ij which is epsilon 1 1 plus epsilon 2 2 plus epsilon 3 3 so we can therefore collect those terms and remember that the trace of epsilon ij is also delta the dilatation and so therefore we have that sigma naught is equal to lambda plus two-thirds mu times delta the dilatation or rearranging that k the bulk modulus is sigma naught over delta is three lambda plus two mu divided by three so let's summarize the key points of this lecture on elastic solids we found that in elastic solids the stress depends only on the strain the simplest and commonest case is a linear stress strain relation which is known as a Hookean elastic material. The general constitutive equation for a Hookean elastic solid has 21 independent constants in the fourth order elasticity tensor after we've taken into consideration the mathematical symmetries. However, the material symmetry of the material allows us to further simplify the constitutive equation. And the simplest material symmetry of all is isotropy. The constitutive law for isotropic linearly elastic solids only requires two material constants, the Lame constants lambda and mu. And the Young's modulus E and Poisson ratio nu can be measured in the same uniaxial test and are sufficient to compute both lambda and mu for an isotropic linearly elastic solid.